Welcome back to another episode of Sideways, a podcast about motorcycling uh, in Taiwan. I'm Michael Branica, a uh, YouTuber and uh, off-road riding enthusiast. And this here is Sasha Finster, uh, who's a, a, an off and on-road riding instructor at Moto Skills Factory. Thanks for having me. So in our la one of our previous episodes, um, we had gone over the, the, the various um, options uh, of, of big bikes in Taiwan. And uh, we on our list was actually the, the V-Strom uh, 1000. A and I was running low on battery. It was running really long. So we, we just cut, cut that one. But I think it's worth talking about because um, it is one of the more affordable options here uh, in Taiwan. And uh, so just to run down the specs uh, really quick, it, it makes right around a, a, 100 horsepower. Um, it's uh, 236 kilograms. The seat height is 850 uh, millimeters. So um, before it didn't have any electronics. Most of the ones you see running around in Taiwan yeah. didn't have any electronics. But then uh, I believe it was 2020, they, they, they went through and upgraded the electronics. They changed the styling a little bit. Um, and when I looked online, I saw that it was around uh, 628,000 NT. Uh, so just a quick aside, we're, we're outside we're, we're, uh, where they're riding motorcycles. So you're going to hear two-stroke motorcycles rip by. And, you know, that, that's part of, the, part of the fun, right? right exactly. Uh, I'm not going to try and edit that out. <laughs> no. So, so um, I, you know, I think it's one of the more affordable options. I have gotten to ride that bike myself. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on it. Well, um, yeah, in Taiwan, actually, a, a, there is there's a huge group actually that rides that. You know, you see that constantly that that model on the road, the thousand and the six fifty. Um, it's it's um, a really nice bike if you like to travel and do a little bit of off road riding. Um, to me personally, I was a little bit, uh, um, yeah. It was a, yeah, it, it was really a bummer, right? Um, with the new styling that you just mentioned, right? It looks a lot like the grandfather, right? Um, it looks really nice. It has like this off-road styling, that feel to it. But as soon as you, you look more to the bottom, you realize nothing has changed, you know? Uh, even though, yeah, they tweaked the, 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 the frame a little bit and the suspension a little bit, it's basically the same, right? Uh, plus, the, the weight that you just mentioned, um, now it is basically the same weight as the GS1250, right? And this is just like 245 kilograms. Um, you know, I would rather pick up a GS than the V-Strom with that weight because of the boxer engine, you know? Um, we actually had uh, uh, one yesterday, we had a, a, a small event, a promotion event, and yeah, it looks nice. It looks really, it, it looks beautiful. And I've seen, you know, bikes abroad where they've, you know, customized it and everything and different suspension and they even slapped on 21, 18 inch uh, wheels on it. And it looks really, really nice then. But stock, um, yeah, it, it's, it's a lot heavier now. You have all the electronical gimmicks. So this will be great for anyone who is a tech freak, whatever, you know. And the only thing is you should not expect too much off-road from, from it because, um, yeah, ground clearance is still pretty low compared to other, you know, ADV bikes, you know, adventure bikes. Um, plus, there's one small detail that I just don't get. If you look closely at the stock crash bars on the bottom side, you, the, the crash bars don't not only go along the engine, but they have this small piece that goes like out like this hmm. and I don't understand this because this is a, the perfect recipe for you know bending your frame and stuff you know mm -hmm. because if you go off-road and you have you know this half donut sticking out it, you just have to hit a, 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 a root or whatever you know and you know there you go um, that I, I don't understand why they did that you know so yeah. but then on the other side that bike again it does not have off-road ABS it does not even have, uh, as far as I know, a switch to switch off ABS. So, uh, yeah, last Thursday we had three DLs there again. And uh, every time, you know, well, not every time, but in the morning we had to stop, take off the seat, 
take out the fuse, stick it in the side, and uh, keep on riding. I mean, the good thing would be uh, you don't have to worry about you know switching off your bike, switching back back on, and then adjusting everything again like you have with most bikes. So I guess that would be a good thing, but you still have to stop and take out the, the fuse. And it just, it just shows Suzuki is not, right now at least, going into the real, you know, off-road segment of adventure bikes, yeah. Yeah, um, a, a lot of the Japanese bikes, um, they don't make it easier to turn off the ABS. Um, you know, the Tenere 1200, they put it up on the center stand and run it up to like 30 miles an hour stationary and then it tricks the computer and it turns it off. It doesn't happen, like it doesn't function always because uh, when I was in Germany for trainings, we also had the 1200 Super Tenere and it didn't work there. Yeah. Maybe it's the German version, I don't know, yeah. but it did not work. So the only good thing, I guess, is the fuse box is on the side, but you still have to take off the side covers and everything, you know, yeah. so that's what they did then, you know, but <clears throat> yeah, same thing, exactly. Yeah, it, it's kind of weird how they do that. Um, so yeah, my experience, my first experience with, with the V-Strom 1000, we went down to the Wujie riverbed and we did some easy river crossings and twice he ended up getting stuck on a rock <laughs> um, and, and I had to run out to the middle of the stream and catch it before it fell over. Uh, and then like there was like four of us dragging the bike over the rocks. Um, and, and it doesn't come with, with, with protection for the, for the uh, engine and the exhaust that runs right underneath. It's the lowest thing. I mean, you can't help but, but, run, but hit things on it. And, and it, it, yeah, it just gets stuck on stuff. Um, you got to invest in, in crash protection for it, obviously. Um, and then when we were at one of your trainings, um, w one of your students, one of your friends, um, allowed me to ride his, his bike. And my first experience with it, I just felt like this is a, a, a lot of metal, <laughs> like a huge <laughs> amount of steel, like sitting there. Um, it definitely felt like a street bike with dirt tires on it. Um, as opposed to when I rode your 790, that felt like an off-road bike, like a big dirt bike, right? And so um, we were riding right around the same place and there's all these GLs. And you can do this thing where you, you push weight down through the pegs and you allow the rebound to make the bike light. Um, and I could do that on your 790, but uh, the the V-Strom 1000, it didn't get light even a little bit. <laughs> Like I pushed down as hard as I could and it just sat there. It was yeah. just like, <laughs> just in place. And so I was like, you know, but I did go up some steep little ups and I got the front tire up. Eh, it was okay. Yeah. You know, it can, it can do the thing, you know, if you want to do the thing, right. but it's not, it's not ever going to feel like a big dirt bike ever. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, you, you can feel it is road bias, you yeah. know, I mean, um, I mean, it has 19, 17 inches, you know, inch tires, so it's okay, you know. Um, but it, it's it's a little bit similar to to the the Tiger 800 XCA that I rode. It was also good off road, but as soon as you push a little bit, it was either like too harsh or it just the last bit just went through the stroke real fast. So like there was no, it was not, it was not clear, transparent, right? It just did one or the other. Uh, because you could feel like this is just out of its, you know, comfort zone, basically, right? Yeah. So the the, the V-Strom is a great bike. Um, the the funny funny thing is when I look at uh, North American adventure bike reviews on YouTube, whatever, they have the V-Strom. In Europe, they don't, yeah. right? And uh, which is interesting because I I believe in North America you have even more opportunities to ride off-road adventure uh, routes and everything than in Europe. You also have them in Europe but I think in, in North America even more. So I think it's, it's great that they believe that this is an off-road capable bike. I really do, you know, and I admire them, um, especially like you said, in stocks, uh, stock setup, you know, if, if you spend some money to make it more off-road worthy, I think it will be great, but then I, not everyone is willing to do that. You yeah. know, so there, there might be other options where you don't really have to spend that money and it's stock, in, in stock uh, setup, it's a little, might, more suitable what you want to do yeah yeah so let's talk about some of those um there have been some interesting announcements since our last conversation um and the first one 
you know, we, we, we had said we didn't know when the, the, the Tenere 700 would, if ever, be brought into Taiwan, but they announced that. Um, so, so they had first announced that it was 468 um, thousand, right. but then you were telling me that, that, that they've, they're already trying to lift the price. They actually did, yeah. From March 1st, uh, the price went up for, to 488,000, so 20,000, 200,000 more, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, it is, everyone is talking about that bike now. The price is definitely very tempting, right? I mean, it, it is actually, to be honest, to me, that price is more reasonable. Yeah. like compared to other bikes, right? Yeah. And I, I do hope that it, it causes something similar that it did, for example, in Europe, you know, where you have the 790 ADVR, where you have everything uh, compared to the Tenere that is just, has, has the basics, right? Uh, both bikes, if you look around, both bikes are great. People are buying one or the other and they're happy with both. Yeah. Uh, so you cannot say, okay, you need all the, the electronics to be happy or chuck everything and that will make you happy. You know, it just depends on you. So, but yeah, it, it's interesting because we already have, uh, also in, in my uh, student group, a lot of people there are interested in it. We have a few who are also did a, made a down payment already. And um, yeah, and then all of a sudden they told me, yeah, from March 1st, they, they jacked up the price. So, and that's what they did. So now it's uh, 20,000 more. And um, yeah. So is this Yamaha that's importing them or is it another no, company? No, it's a gray import. Yeah. Right? So um, I'm, uh, Yamaha uh, Taiwan, that was like impossible for them that they would even consider that bike. Um, I, but maybe what's going to happen is like maybe it's going to be the same thing what happened to the Africa Twin because my Africa Twin before, that was also gray import and they sold them actually pretty well. And then after, uh, I think a few years, two or three years, whatever, then Honda Taiwan picked it up, yeah. right? And maybe after they see how well that sells, I'm pretty sure they don't, they, they want a piece of that cake as well. Yeah. So um, they're gonna import that. To, to, to my understanding, uh, that also happened with the, with the Honda CRF 250s. Right. The first ones were imported gray market. Right. Um, and, and I'm pretty sure that those early 2015s um, were, the, were the full suspension models right. one reason they hold their value mm. whereas the ones that yamaha i mean honda uh the official one imported were the low model which i think that was not not a good move um but but uh, i mean it was a good move for a lot of people i think a lot of people like the seat um but yeah i i you see this trend of manufacturers um uh jumping on once they see yeah. that that uh the gray imports sell then they're like, well, we want a piece of this action. Exactly. And they can import them at, at significant uh, discounts. Yes. Um, they don't always pass that on to us, but, but they can. Mm. Um, it, generally, if you, if you compare the price of a gray market to the price of, a, of, of, an, of an official vehicle, um, it's, it's, it's a lot of difference. Yeah, right. Oh, let's see how, how that plays out. You know, it's just uh, with Honda, I'm always careful because Honda and Taiwan, the bikes are all... Um, the engines are all tempered with, let's put it this way, you know? Yeah. So even if they're below 100 horsepower, they're still, they're still lower than uh, stock spec. Yeah. So that's why like the, the Africa Twins, they make around 200, uh, sorry, so around 94 horsepower, whatever. Um, yeah, but they, the, the official Taiwan Honda Africa Twins, they're on 84. So roughly 10 horsepower less, uh, some say 86, whatever, you know? Um, so yeah, th this is one thing I'm hoping Yamaha would not do that, you know, yeah. but that will take yeah. at least, a, at least I think a year or two until they, they consider importing them themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let's, uh, go on, uh, <coughs> and, and talk about the, the KTM 1290, um, ADVR, um, the, the only, the only person that I've seen so far to be riding them is Chris Birch. Yeah. Um, and they, they've moved the tanks down lower. The engine seems like it's about the same, um, but everybody loves that engine anyway. Yeah. You know, you can look back at our previous episode where we talked about that engine. Um, and it, 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 it seems to be the weight uh, and, the, and the electronics seem to be more advanced. Right. right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But who knows when, when that's going to come out. Um, 
they're not even bringing the new one to the United States for this year. The, the United States still gets the old model. And so Taiwan's always behind and who, you know, who knows when, when we're going to get that. Right. Um, but, you know, do you have some more thoughts on, on that bike? Well, again, I, I know as much as you do. Um, but to me, I, I love the 1290 ADVR, like absolutely love it. Um, and the new one just looks so much more promising. Yeah. Um, it, it's just uh, because it, it handles well. It is a great engine, like you said. Uh, the only thing that could be better uh, that work, for example, the, the big GS was still having a little bit in certain areas only, but where the, the GS still had a little bit of an advantage was, you know, the, the center of mass. Mm. And now with the, the tank, like the 790 and 890, you know, pulled down, like it, I'm sure it's going to be very, very different. So I'm like, to me personally, all these electronics and radon, everything, you know, more stuff to break, you know, but, but just that feature that it has that tank, I think that's going to be an, like make, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to ride that bike. Yeah. Uh, so this will be an I, amazing bike. I don't think the R model is getting the radar. I think that's the S model. No, no, R also as well. It's also getting yeah. it. They, they all like the front, the whole front screen has been changed on the S and the R model. So it, the, you also have like, uh, it's funny, I've seen pictures, they compared the, the new front with uh, General Grievous from Star Wars. Yeah. So, like, because it has a cutout and you have like that small little, you know, rectangle black box there. Okay. So yeah, both have, have the radar. But yeah. yeah, I mean, it has to be placed in the front, but that's also where you first crash and hit stuff. So, yeah. but yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, an I'm, off-road bike doesn't really need radar, but I mean, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of good things about it. You know, the the the, the multi strata um, ha has it as well. Yeah. Um, right. It seems like Bosch is pushing it really hard because they they want to sell them and they want them right. on all the bikes, and it's it's like a thousand U.S. dollar option, um, and and it just comes packaged with everything. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, they're making a killing off of that. Definitely, definitely. No, um, I'm I'm also curious so far. Uh, KTM Taiwan told me that for this year they plan to import three 1290s. Okay. I mean, then you can you can do the math. Three, how many S and how many R models? You know, <laughs> if any R models, you know, three. Um, so when they're gonna arrive, I'm not sure. So it's probably I I might think it's gonna be a 2021 model arriving in 2022. Yeah. <laughs> you know, someday, but but anyways, no that that bike the 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 upgrades I think is gonna be that exactly what it needed yeah. you know because the the gs sometimes it is great because it's so low uh the, the center of gravity is so low and whatever but sometimes it, it could be a little bit higher to make it a little bit more nimble and now with a tank where you have basically everything in, in that range between i think that would would make it a possible possible gs killer like like yeah. on 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 like everything you yeah. know like right yeah. now the the R is just killing the GS on, on off-road surfaces. On-road, obviously, the, the GS has a little more comfort and everything. Um, but yeah, this bike, let's see. Yeah. When? <laughs> yeah, we'll see. And then another another uh, a bike that, that's a wait-and-see bike is the Harley-Davidson Pan America um, 1250. And and the specs, they, they're, they really look very promising. Yes. You know, the weight is right in there with the GS. Um, more horsepower, 150 horsepower, and you know it's got it's got a 19 in the front, it's got a 17 in the back. It's it's uh it's not going after that hardcore off-road, you know ADVR sort of market market, but um, it's going after the GS. It's got its sights set right on the GS, and um, the the styling it's quite controversial. <laughs> um, I, I guess I guess my counter, I, you know, that I've heard people point out is. I mean, what in that category is beautiful like <laughs> yeah, all yeah, of it right. all of it is kind of an ugly duckling when yeah. you when you look at the gs like you you wouldn't think like oh that's a, a beautiful bike but it, it kind of grows on you yeah. over time you know and and the the multi strata as well it's got that weird looking beak when that first <laughs> came out you're just like what is this <laughs> um and and so this that that front end that that a lot of people are just like i don't know on the pan america like it's kind of in keeping with with the rest of the market. I yeah, think. yeah. Well, I mean, it, it also. Ha I mean, you look at it and you can tell it's a Harley. 
Yeah. And I think this is also very important then that you identify that brand immediately and stuff. Um, to me, it looks like a Lego bike, like literally yeah. like a Lego <laughs> bike. But, but then again, I, I do hope it's one of these cases where it looks questionable on pictures, but when you stand in front of it, it's like, well, you know what? That works, you know? Yeah, yeah. Because there are bikes like this. I remember back then when the new Fireblade came out with that new styling, whatever, like not a couple years ago, but like, like I don't know, 10 years ago, whatever. It looked like, I don't know, bubble gum commercial bike, whatever. I don't know. And I stood in front of it, then it's like, that looks cool. You know, that's really, really great, you know, with that small, tiny rear section, everything and stuff. It looks cool. So I'm, you know, don't be too quick to judge, you know, you never know. So my last hope will be it looks awesome, you know, when you stand in front of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But don't, no, uh, it's it's great that Harley's trying that as well. Um, I never thought I'm going to see myself walk into a Harley dealership, you know, <laughs> but I will, you know, yeah. soon this year. And I definitely am curious about that bike. I'm not too sure, sure how offer capable it is. You, you've seen pictures of it, you know, being you know having some airtime going yeah. on and stuff um you know you can make any bike fly yeah. but like you know how it looks like after it resurfaces uh, re uh, reattaches to the to, yeah. to the ground you know that's yeah. a little different but no um i'm really curious about that bike how that handles you know uh, like you said it is not hardcore off-road you know uh designed for that but um i'm, I'm thinking especially in north american air uh, uh that market I think it's going to be a huge competition for the GS. Yeah. Not sure, not too sure about Europe, but North North America definitely. You yeah. know, and um, it should be. You yeah. know, and uh, you, you have a lot of people who 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 want to support the Harley brand. Yeah. Um. And and you know it is it is the quintessential American brand, and I think that uh, one of the interesting things, especially for Asia, is the is the the ride technology that when you come to a stop or you you know you slow down it lowers itself mm. and you have a lot of people who are intimidated by big heavy tall adventure bikes um and this is th this is groundbreaking we've never seen anyone try this before and so um i i think it'll it'll make a lot of the 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 asians who are very conscious of the seat height like you hear them talk about it mm. all the time right they're here in taiwan they're very conscious of seat height I think it'll make them have a look. Right. No, uh, yesterday our, our, our promotional event was about that, you know, yeah. about seat height, how to tackle a big bike that it has a higher center of gravity, that is bigger, that has a higher seat and everything, you know. So definitely, I'm not that tall myself, uh, so I understand that that fear. And, like, my, my secret weapon is my weight. I sit on it and it just goes down. <laughs> um, but, no, that technology has been, like, in, around for a while. Like, I'm, I'm like companies talking about this and, and trying to figure that out. Um, myself, when I think about going off-road riding, having that kind of suspension adjustment system on it, I just wondered, you, just now you mentioned the, the V-Strom, you know, you know, sitting on, on, on a rock, you know, crossing riverbed, right? What happens if you're off-road riding and you come to a standstill and it lowers, and, uh, it lowers under a rock? Under <laughs> your rock. Exactly, you know, <laughs> it's like, okay, what's gonna happen now, you know? Is it smart enough to identify that? Do you need radar on the bottom of your bike as long as I don't know, you know? So that's, that's the thing, you know? We'll, we'll see how that plays out then. Yeah, but you can lock it out. Mm. Like, you can turn off that feature. Well, but then again, you know, it's like, especially, I mean, we see it all the time, especially when you feel un, unsafe or not so confident. That's when you want to have that, right? That's true. But yeah. that's mostly off-road riding, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you, you want to switch it off, but you shouldn't switch it off, and then you're in a pickle again, right? Yeah. If your bike doesn't have it, well, you have to deal with it then, right? Yeah. But if you have that option, like, okay, what, what am I going to do now? You know, yeah. it's like, it's same with, like, off-road ABS or, you know, enduro mode and stuff. But, yeah, that's a different topic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so we'll close it there. Um, you know, s subscribe to us for, for, more, uh, for more content. We'll, we'll try and keep, keep up with the latest stuff. Um, and you know we've got got more episodes coming out uh all the time um and and uh we'll see you next time <laughs>